All right. Well, um, it is uh, 12.02, coming up on 12.03. So um, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to this, the, I believe it's the ninth uh, presentation in our sustainability research and practice <laughs> seminar for the fall 2020 semester. We're grateful you're here and we're very much looking forward to Professor Dent's uh, presentation. I wanna um, start with just a couple of uh, thank yous. Um, first to uh, our co-sponsors for this series, um, the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs and the Office for Digital Learning and Innovation. Um, they've been uh, very helpful in uh, putting this together and we're proud to be co-sponsoring the series with them. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kressler, to Walt Kressler, uh, who helps us uh, archive all of the sessions that we have done this semester uh, on the Digital Commons uh, uh, service of the uh, Francis Harvey Green Library. Um, and I'd also like to just uh, make one quick announcement um, for any of you who have not yet registered for the Global Conference on Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, yes, in fact, it occurred last week, but um, Westchester University is a host sponsor institution. Um, and as such, uh, you can continue to register and view um, all of the uh, dozens, probably hundreds of um, inspiring and um, fascinating sessions on all kinds of uh, aspects of sustainability in higher education. So if you have not yet registered, um, please do go to our uh, website homepage and you'll find a link there with instructions for doing so. It's free of charge for anyone with a wcupa.edu email address. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to uh, thank Professor Dent for uh, being with us today, and I'll hand over the digital floor to you. Thanks. All right. So Marcy, um, Amy, should I just get started with the share? Is that all right? Yeah, go right ahead. The screen share um, is yours. All righty. Sam. Well, thank you, Brad. Um, the sustainability group is one of my favorite groups on campus, even though I don't get to be as actively involved, um, but because I am very passionate about um, the work that you do. So thank you for inviting me to be a part of this this year. I'm very honored and touched. Um, so as, as um, Brad was saying, my name is Claire Dente mm -hmm. and I'm a professor of social work in the undergraduate social work department. And I wanna thank you for coming to my presentation on human rights and social, economic, and environmental justice, the ethics of Samphan Sind and Agape. Um, I have, um, how, how I got into this, I have a very interesting family. I'm the oldest of three children. Um, my mom was one of three and my dad was one of five, including his twin sister. And so if you added all of us up, there are about 30 first cousins between both sides of the family. That's a lot of people. Um, but the three I know the best were my dad's twin sisters, three children. Um, because they were twins, they were very close. We spent most of our holidays together, had visits in the summer. Um, and, the, and the great thing was that my aunt's three children and my dad's three children, three of us, were pretty well matched age-wise. And so uh, that was very convenient, right? Um, but we also spent a lot of time together and um, things like Thanksgiving and other holidays became extremely memorable. And so when I think of family, I think of some of those cousins as my closest um, family. Um, I was the, of those six, I was the oldest and my cousin Amy was the youngest. Um, Amy is in that picture there on the left with the darker hair. Um, all I can say is she's younger than me, but I have tremendous respect for Amy. Uh, she's a very gifted, intelligent woman. She attended Barnard College and she went to Columbia University for her master's degree and she studied international affairs where she was hired into a permanent position at the United Nations, which if you are familiar with the UN, you know that is no small feat. It's usually uh, grant work and project driven. 
Um, Amy traveled all over the world, and she's the only person I know who can say that she has visited all three countries of the Axis of Evil. Um, and in the course of her UN work, she ended up at the Republic of Georgia, the country, not the state, um, where she met Ava, the woman on the right with the blonder hair. And then Ava ultimately became her wife. And so that was another thing that we both shared eventually coming out as, as gay. So we had this in common. Um, Ava is Danish and she was born and raised in Copenhagen. They have a son, he's now about 12 or 13. So you can tell that picture was taken a while ago. Um, but so you can see where I'm going as far as this Danish term, Sam van Sien. So um, when I think about, you know, our world community, you know, even my family is, is global. And I, I love that about my family, right? I, lo I just, I love learning so many new things. So my Danish language comes from Eva. Um, it is extremely limited. I do not pretend to speak Danish, nor will I pronounce either of these words correctly, I'm sure. Um, but before it was chic, Eva and Amy taught me about Hygge. I think that's how you say it. Hygge has become very trendy now, but it wasn't always known to most folks. I kind of felt cool, like I knew it before it was cool. Um, Hygge is the Danish concept. It doesn't have a direct translation to English, but its meaning is close to what we might consider coziness, uh, warmth, something we share with those who are close to us. And when um, my wife Leslie and I were married, Ama, Amy and Ava, their wedding gift to us was a box with a warm woolen blanket, a commonly scented candle, some delicious cookies and fresh uh, tea. Um, and they said this was a gift of Hygge. So that was a really nice um, introduction to some of the Danish concept of Hygge. Um, so because my cousin Amy and Eva um, live in Copenhagen now, um, they have lived in Geneva and New York with the UN work. Um, my cousin now works for the Danish Council on Refugees, um, but they're based in Copenhagen now. Um, Amy shared this article from the BBC about Samfonsin. And it's it's on my last slide. Everything, there's a link to it. And so when you get the slides, you'll be able to read up anything. Um, so the article talked about, whoops, I'm getting some feedback here. Is there a mic on? Maybe if you could, could turn it off. Is anyone else hearing that feedback? Yes. Okay. Yes. It would be helpful if everybody muted their, their phones. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, still on. Oh, well. I'll do the best. <laughs> so my cousin um, uh, uh, shared this um, article, and it, it started to talk about a, a high-end restaurant in Denmark. And the owner was a Michelin-rated chef. And what he did was he... Um, converted his business, he had just opened in the this past winter. And when the, the um, pandemic began and uh, the economies were, you know, stopped and people were homeless and people had no, no food and they couldn't access things, they weren't making money. He converted his, his restaurant from this high-end uh, Michelin star rated facility into um, making sustainable food for the community. Um, he made meals for folks who were impacted by the economic shutdown, for people who were homeless, and for people who were impacted in many different ways um, by COVID. So of course, this appealed to me as a social worker. So a lot of my information on Sam Funson initially comes from this BBC source. And like I said, it is um, at the end of this presentation. So the link, the single link will take you there. <clears throat> so Sam Funson, comes from Danish, the same people who brought you this concept of hygge and coziness with your loved ones. But what exactly is Sam van Sind? Um, so Danish term, there's again, no exact um, translation to English. Um, it is a term that regain, regained more use earlier this year after the prime minister of Denmark used the term uh, when referencing the, the pandemic. And Sanfonsin connotes a way to be with folks that we don't necessarily know, 
in the same way that we do with Hugo. So I wanna read you a quote from the BBC article that I mentioned by Mark Johansson. <clears throat> and I apologize, I was teaching all morning, so my voice is a little shot. Like Hugo, there's no direct English translation of Samfonsind. Marianne Rata, senior researcher at the Danish Language Council, says you can think of it as putting the good of the greater society above your own personal interests. Danes believe this word has played a key role in the country's successful response to the pandemic. According to Raja, Samfund Sind is a compound noun of Samfund, which means society, and Sind, which means mind. It dates back to 1936 and made an historical cameo in a call for solidarity by then Prime Minister Thorvald Stauning at the outbreak of World War II. Thereafter, it lay in relative dormancy until Prime Minister Meta Fredriksson revived the word at a press conference on March 11th earlier this year, announcing the first major measures to shut down the country. She presented Samfonsind to Danes as having two main pillars, collective responsibility and community spirit. And so these two, um, pieces, collective responsibility and community spirit are part, part of what I want to focus on today as, as we think about um, social justice and human rights. And so the Danes were led by their prime minister and embraced this idea of thinking about others, not just yourself, and of thinking of yourself as part of a community where, quote, putting aside individuality for the benefit of the community has become an even stronger pillar of Danish identity. What a concept. Um, as we reevaluate our own leadership with the election only a week away, I find that these, um, these ideals, these, these values are impacting how I think about things. I want to shift a little to my Greek language competency, which is even more limited than my Danish language competency. Um, I recall learning about agape, um, back in my high school religion and theology classes. I am not a linguist or a philosopher <clears throat> or a theologian, and I can't help but getting nervous talking about something outside of my discipline because there's always someone who's more knowledgeable or an expert out there and who will know that I'm probably slaughtering the concept. So I, I, I give my apologies in advance to the philosophy department. But agape was explained to me back then as a form of love in contrast to eros, which was more the sexual romantic love and attraction, or philia, which we know well in Philadelphia, brotherly love, or as we say, and sisterly affection. And what I took from that was an understanding of agape as a non-romantic and non-sexual love that included a genuine concern for the well-being of another person or a group. And I tried poking around the literature on agape in preparation for today, many years later from my high school classes. I discovered that many sources spoke about agape as linked more so to solely the Christian tradition, which I was not necessarily looking for, but, um, but this idea of an understanding of love that kind of came from this um, group um, and, and extension of um, love to the broader community. I didn't necessarily want to get in too deep on the nuances of agape or any specific theological tradition, but rather to suggest that Sind and agape sounded similar to me and the neurons in my brain that linked me back to high school. So why am I bringing this up in a sustainability presentation? As a social worker, we have six core social work values that um, undergird the National Association of Social Workers or the NASW Code of Ethics. Code of Ethics was recently revised in 2017. Um, and the core values are service, competence, integrity, social justice, the dignity and worth of the person, and the importance of human relationships. 
these core values are really important to me, both as an individual person and as a professional social worker. There's a lot of um, connection between my personal values and my professional values, um, which is, is very helpful in how I do my work. The profession of social work, also because we are a profession, has an accrediting body. We are accredited here at Westchester, both the MSW and the BSW program. And the Council on Social Work Education, or as we call it, CSWE, has come out with educational policy and accreditation standards. And these were recently revised in 2015, but were due for another revision. I believe they're revised every seven, six or seven years. So competency three, what we expect all of our social work grads to be skilled at is to advance human rights and social, economic, and environmental justice. And so you can see where I got the title for this presentation from, um, particularly in our current society of how important this is. Um, of this um, particular competency, it's broken down into a couple of parts. <clears throat> I highlighted some keywords here on the screen. But one is that social workers, and, and again, I, I think that this is what, um, what fuels my work as a social worker, but I also feel that as a social worker, I put these values forth to our society. And when we talk about sustainability, I think that a lot of these things are very closely linked. But that we understand that every person, regardless of their position in society, has a fundamental human right, such as freedom, safety, privacy, an adequate standard of living, healthcare, and education. Every person. That's a person with a disability. That's a person who's a deaf reporter. That's women. That's immigrants. That's black and brown, indigenous people, every person. Second point, social workers understand the global interconnections of oppression and human rights violations and are knowledgeable about theories of human need and social justice and strategies to promote social and economic justice and human rights. So we're looking for that glue, what's holding these things together so that we can make those interventions when we need to, to uh, break cycles of oppression. Point three, social workers understand strategies designed to eliminate oppressive structural barriers to ensure that social goods, rights, and responsibilities are distributed equitably and that civil, political, environmental, economic, social, and cultural human rights are protected. I have to say, as I've been following the news these past couple of days, this particular competency has been right in my face, um, even more so than it has been over the past few years. Um, you know, our, our challenge in Philadelphia uh, right now are our own people being shot um, by law enforcement. And so how do we eliminate systemic racism, these structural barriers that immediately present people as a threat? And I'll talk a little more about some of my thoughts on that later. And finally, social workers apply their understanding of social, economic, and environmental justice to advocate for human rights at the individual and system level, and also to engage in practices that advance social, economic, and environmental justice. CSWE's competency three is undoubtedly a tall order if lived out to the fullest in its boldest expression, I believe this mandate could revolutionize not only the profession of social work, but our country and the way in which our entire global community functions. This competency links to the 17 United Nations Sustainable Goals. And also, I know many of you are familiar with these, to the um, Grand Challenges for Social Work, <clears throat> You're probably less familiar with these. Um, these do tend to overlap in many areas. And regardless of who identifies these concerns, 
or how we name them. It is a call to all of us to identify the needs of our global community. Um, there is some overlap here as far as education and healthcare, um, you know, the environment, gender equality, um, in the social work grand challenges. And again, this is a live link. If you um, are interested in exploring these more, you should be able to get to it. Um, things like eliminating racism, boy, does that really hit hard right now. Promoting smart decarceration, um, building financial capability. So we get into some of our economic and, and systemic racism and systemic barriers here. Um, building a stronger social fabric and also well being for individuals and families. So, Danish Prime Minister Meta Frederiksen, back in March, stated at a press conference We have to stand together by keeping our distance. We need community spirit. We need help. I would like to thank all who have so far shown that this is exactly what we have in Denmark. Samfundsind. As leadership, the Prime Minister appealed for a community response to advance a goal, and the community responded. I'm trying to imagine that happening here. Samfundsind and Agape became expressions of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Goals, the Social Work Grand Challenges and CSWE social work competency to advance human rights and social and economic and environmental justice. In Denmark, they took this on as a personal communal challenge. And when I started to think about this concept in the United States and towards a sustainable uh, community, I thought about Americans and, and all people living in the United States. We have a generous spirit. When there is a natural disaster, we tend to do some of that immediate work. When there are tragedies in families, I recall a few years back, my, um, my wife's sister lost her husband to a heart attack when they were on vacation. People coming together, bringing meals, watching the children, helping her fix her house up, cutting her lawn. You know, we do that sort of thing. Um, We've done it historically at rallying points in our history. World War II, when I was um, sending my mom, who's 86, pictures of the supermarket and the bare shelves when the pandemic first hit, she said to me, this reminds me of World War II. There was nothing. And you had stamps, rationing stamps to buy food and sugar and things like that. And so people rallied and they came together. Um, post 9-11, 2001, I remember it was one of the few times I could get on 95 without being cut off. People let you in, right? So, so people had this sense of community. Um, so there is some, some precedent here, right? Um, but it also, those kinds of situations remind me of when we teach our students about social justice and the babies in the river, and immediate work is pulling those babies out of the river and saving them, and we need to do that. But sometimes somebody needs to hike up the river and find out who's putting those babies into the river and intervene there, right? So when we help out following a natural disaster or a tragedy, that's pulling those babies out of the river. When we start saying, hey, how come there's climate change that's impacting the weather that's causing these natural disasters, we're hiking up the river. So when we think about um, the Danish prime minister and her call upon the nation, um, perhaps with an element of agape, she was raising awareness of the need for communal concern and taking actions to enhance the well-being of each other. Um, the call to the nation for unity to concern for others certainly demonstrated uh, my social work ethics of service, competence, integrity, dignity and worth of the person importance of human relationships and social justice. And the COVID pandemic has had an interesting impact on us in the United States. Fredrickson talked about standing apart to stand together. But in the United States, we seem to have politicized these things. 
And it's made it harder for us perhaps to embrace these concepts. Um, we've politicized the pandemic. We've politicized strategies to reduce its impact, such as mask wearing and social distancing. And we have, in some arenas, an anti-science bias, a disrespect for experts, not only in health, but we've certainly seen it when we talk about climate change. So I went back to those two concepts that I mentioned earlier as defining Samfonsind and social work ethics, our collective responsibility and our community spirit. And as I said, I could place my own social work ethics, which link with my personal ethics under collective responsibility, this idea of social justice, that all should have access to healthcare and education and clean water, to being competent, to knowing how to care for each other and the importance of human relationships and how important it is to reach out to people, to build coalitions so that we can work together. In terms of community spirit, I thought about the social work ethic of integrity, of being able to be counted on and relied on, of being who we are and saying who we are, of service, of giving when it needs to be given, and the dignity and worth of each human person, that each person in our community has value. Also, thinking about collective responsibility I was thinking about sustainability living in the conscience of all of us, reducing our waste, creative inventions to do that. Many of you are far better at that than I am in the sustainability um, um, office. Maximizing potential, not just of, you know, reuse, recycle kinds of things, but of human potential. No one should be lost, no child, should have to drink polluted water in Flint, Michigan, right? Um, and in thinking of social justice, addressing those needs, regardless of status, our responsibility to address poverty and hunger and health and education and dignified work, these values that we see in both the UN and the social work challenges. And the other thing I really liked about Samfun Sindh and this idea of collective responsibility was that it's very strengths-based, that each one of us has something to contribute regardless of the amount of talents or intelligence that we have, that we all have something we can bring to the table. And in our community spirit, embracing each other as one family, collaboration, reasonable competition, it's one thing to win, it's another thing to win and then destroy the competitor. Trickle down theories that actually reach the bottom. I'm always struck when economists and sometimes politicians talk about, well, if we just trickle down, it will help the lower income folks. And yet I see the higher income folks amassing more wealth while the lower income folks don't ever get those drops. And tied with that would be challenging this in sense of entitlement and consumerism and greed. How much do we really need? Measuring our successes and celebrating them. And this idea that all creation is one. It's a big theme for me right now. This idea of dignity, integrity, respect. How do we build bridges between groups, communities, nations? political parties. So to me, San Vincent also involves seeking unity. And I see it as actually a spiritual process, not a religious process, a spiritual process. This idea of becoming one, of connection, of making meaning. If I'm connected to you and I'm connected to the ground I walk on and I'm connected, how can I not help but care? I wanted to play this um, YouTube video of a song, um, I'll, I'll date myself with my age, but song's called Conviction of the Heart and it was by um, Kenny Loggins. So if you'll humor me, I would like to put this on and let me make sure that it's playing. All right, um, let me get back here.
That was great. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. I feel I, old, I, <laughs> 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 I know, but I, I actually really love that song because and especially now I'm, I'm trying to go back to things that um, make me feel hopeful, right? Um, you know, one with the earth, with the sky, one with everything in life. And yet we have to think about um, air that's too angry to breathe, water our children can't drink. Do you care enough? Where's your conviction of the heart? Um, you know, children, families, people with mental illness being stabbed or shot. Uh, it's the weight of the burden of, of what is so offensive in our world right now. Um, and so as I was thinking about what would collective responsibility and community spirit look like today here and now, I was thinking about, particularly in light of the recent killing of Walter Wallace, Wallace, Wallace Walter, I apologize, I just got that mixed up, um, in terms of mental health issues, Imagining a mental health system where we could support and protect someone for their own and other safety without having to fire a gun. That's sustainability, right? And, and human rights and social justice and samfonsin. Imagine funding more trained crisis teams rather than SWAT teams. And thinking about our law enforcement and judicial systems. Imagine a system where a white prep school boy can't make it through the best schools feeling entitled to sit on the highest court without someone finally intervening first for his alleged addictions and alleged mistreatment of women. Imagine safe places and ways to express one's fear or rage rather than shooting black and brown bodies or looting. Imagine living and working, feeling safe enough to live without having to be in such a state of hyper arousal. Considering our political system, imagine a system that supports fair voting for all, giving people a voice, sustainability. Imagine leaders who debate constructive ideas for the betterment of our society, not their ego. Imagine service leadership at the highest levels of government and the lowest. Imagine informed responsiveness to crises such as our pandemic. Imagine funding initiatives that grow and expand knowledge and provide outreach to raise up individuals and communities. Imagine dignified work and the reduction of poverty and the impact that would have on our economy. And of course, since I'm thinking, imagine John Lennon comes to mind. I won't play his song, don't worry. <laughs> but I want, you know, I, I just think for myself and I think each one of us has to think about how do we, take action to create this more just society because a just society is a sustainable society. Um, and we have to think about here and now, we have to start small, but hopefully end big. And we have to keep having hope for the future. Um, I, I, there are many examples of people doing this. I know I've talked with Brad about PAR Recycle Works. PAR stands for People Advancing Reintegration. And I have a little three minute video that I wanted to show you about some of their work. Um, so if you'll uh, humor me, um, one of the cool things about this group is I know two of the founders of the group, oops, I got to stop share and reshare, rats, and um, what's cool is, is it's called People Advancing Reintegration, and the two people that I know are going to be in this brief little video um, where um, they, they both worked in the prison system in Philadelphia. One is um, Father Tim Lyons and the other one is Laura Ford. Um, and, they, and, and Laura Ford is, is just the kind of soul I have ever met in my life. Um, and since they worked in the prison system they, in Philadelphia, they saw that people would just be put out on the streets after serving their term and they would have no job and nowhere to start and they would have this record. And so they wanted to start something to give folks at least some experience, at least a starting point. And although you're going to see the people who are they're being interviewed here are three white people, um, what you should know is that they have turned over a lot of the leadership of this group 
to folks who have come through the program itself. And so I really like that because they've empowered the community. Neither one of them, I believe, has a social work degree. Um, I won't hold it against them, but um, I just want you to see a little bit about what they're doing and to know that I got Brad to think about this. For You know, why are they coming back? And many, many different reasons, three of which that stood out were joblessness, homelessness, and a lack of community. All Recycle Work is an effort to collect uh, materials that have been thrown away and actually producing jobs as a result of it. The formula is really simple. You get guys who need a job, guys who are getting out of jail. You gather electronic waste, you bring it back, you sort it, you take it apart, and you take it to places that will buy that stuff from you. Out of that, you get a paycheck. People throw things away, they look at it as trash. And recycling, using that same piece of trash for something better. Computers, they throw away uh, old printers, old, old cameras. They got copper in it, aluminum, metal, and things of that nature. There is more gold in one ton of motherboards being recycled than there is in 800 tons of gold ore that we dig out of the earth. My name is Brandon Sanabria Jr. and I've been with PAR for about four months. Brandon has been a real success story to me. I mean, I met him, he came to meet with me at St. Vincent's Church and I interviewed him. And she was like, all right, I want to see how you work. So I did it and she was like, well, we got three people and one will be you. Working here is truly a blessing. My name is Gerald Williams. Uh, I've been with Par Recycle Works now for the past uh, six or seven months. He came in here, uh, we saw that he was a really good hard worker and he's been more than that. He has really grown in his leadership in the midst of the group, is really good at keeping the warehouse organized. I want to walk right back to the block. But I took a different turn this ramp. And I said to myself, I'm going to give myself a chance. So we want to be able to, to do hire more, to provide more wraparound services, to get better known in the community, and, and to grow. I mean, that's, that's the goal. This is how you can help us uh, in our project. You can give us your electronics. What you're done with, we're ready to take. We need people to take on responsibility of setting a, uh, an e-waste drive in their own church or their community. Anybody who's looking to make a contribution, that would be helpful as well. And the other thing that's really important is you could give us access to your jobs network. We want our guys to be successful. We want you to be successful. And programs such as this really works. And we need the community of Philadelphia, Delaware Valley to really, really take a look at this and help us make PAR recycle work. To see them thrive and be part of the commitment really makes me happy. PAR recycle works means hope. Hope in our cities, hope in our families, hope in our communities, hope for the environment. What does Power Recycle Works mean to me? It means just restoring lives and helping the earth. I can vouch for the PAR Recycle Works yeah. Bureau of Media in association with the uh, neighboring Nether Province Township has uh, hired them the last few years for our electronic waste events. They, they do an awesome job. Yeah, and one of the things I really like, thanks Walt, because you know, they, is that they um, are trying to also then encourage employers to hire folks after they leave their program, right? Because it's not a long-term thing that's usually trying to help people when they first are, are moving forward, um, but trying to build relationships with companies and, and the sustainability then kind of goes on, right? And what I love about their work is not only is it environmental sustainability, but it's also human sustainability, the dignity and worth of each person. Um, a couple of things and, um, that I wanted to kind of include here, um, I um, love reading um, things that are 
uh, and beautiful and empowering. And there's this uh, fla um, Pierre Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit who was also a scientist. He was a paleontologist. Got himself in trouble with um, with Rome when he was uh, he was in like the 1800s, 19 I think he died in 1955. And uh, but he had these beautiful writings about the universe and things. And he got in trouble because something around he didn't believe in the literal Garden of Eden, Adam kinds of stuff, which I don't want to get into today. But but these are some beautiful things that make me think about sustainability. Um, I have three quotes. One is the day will come when after harnessing space, the winds, the tides and gravitation, we shall harness, and you can insert God or not, physics, whatever you believe in, the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we shall have discovered fire. Um, I think sustainability is this process of ongoing ways and in even our, our, our desire for human rights and social justice, um, it's ongoing, right? Um, but boy, it's gonna be like harnessing fire again if we ever fully get there. Um, also, the future is more beautiful than all the pasts. That's so hopeful to me. And, and uh, his final uh, quote that I have here, love is the most universal, the most tremendous and the most mystical of cosmic forces. Love is the primal and universal psychic energy. Love is a sacred reserve of energy. It is like the blood of spiritual evolution. Um, to me, the work of human rights, social, economic, environmental justice, Sam Fun Sind, really is a spiritual evolution, a revolution. It's a change in the way that we as, as society looks at things, values people. Um, and as we go forward, we can't give up, right? We can't despair that everything doesn't get finished in our lifetime or in our time frame. Um, we have to look at that little step we take, just like Par does, um, is bringing this forward motion of the universe toward a greater completion, toward greater oneness. Um, and so um, that kind of summarizes my uh, presentation. I just want to thank everybody for um, allowing me to be here today and to share some of my reflections. And if anybody had any comments or thoughts or things you wanted to share. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, uh, it's 1250, so we generally pause for just a second to um, say that if anybody does need to leave right now to prepare for another class uh, or appointment, please uh, feel free to do so. If you have a little bit of time um, for continued conversation and others, I, I welcome you to, to stay on. And uh, let's open up the floor. Just unmute yourself and um, uh, uh, pose your question or comment. I'll jump in real quick. Um, hi, Claire. My name is Pam Francino. I'm in the Center for Civic Engagement and Social Impact. And um, thank you so much. That was a beautiful presentation. I've attended a lot of these, and this might be my favorite one. Um, I really, really enjoyed a lot of what you said, and I'm, I took a lot of notes. I'm excited to look up some of these things and explore a little bit more. But my question for you, I'm just really curious, is this something that you personally are doing research on or have done research on? Or I guess sort of what your inspiration for presenting this today, other than the obvious reasons. Um, love to hear more about that. Um, that's a that's a really uh, good thing to think about. I hadn't even thought about researching it, um, but um, that might be something to really look into. Um, I think because the um, values of social work are so present in our work as a profession, um, I sit on our state ethics committee for NASW, and so we're always reflecting on those codes of ethics, but trying to make that real with my students and, and certainly it's reflected in my teaching. Um, today we had conversation about code of ethics and we talked a lot about what's going on in Philadelphia right now. Talked a lot about the election, of course, in a nonpartisan way, but, but um, how, do, how, do we, how do we bring this stuff alive so it doesn't just become a textbook thing. Oh, I have to know this, you know. I really want my students to um, embrace it 
and to live it and to feel like it is who they are as a profession. Uh, but I really like your idea of thinking about doing some research on, um, on that. That would be really cool. Thank you. Um, I, I share with Pam and um, uh, the curiosity about um, bringing these ideas into a, a scholarly um, program uh, of research. Um, but I'm also struck by the fact that um, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels like this presentation really brings together your role as a professional, as a, a scholar and teacher in this area, and as a, a human being um, who cares about these issues. And I think there's a really powerful place when, when these roles in our lives come together um, uh, to speak to, uh, in this case, an audience of people who are coming from very different uh, professional backgrounds um, and maybe even some different personal perspectives. But um, I just, I was impressed uh, with your presentation about um, how, how it really, um, in my interpretation, is, is bringing together these different parts of your life. This presentation will be essentially a publication going out to the world on digital commons. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm humbled by your comments. I, I, um, I think because social work is such a practice profession that translating sometimes some of the work we do into the, the formal scholarship models, um, I find a little challenging, but I'm really challenged in a good way to try to maybe move forward in some of that with some of the things that you're talking about um, in some of your comments. I think that's really um, inspiring to me. To, to think about moving in those directions. I was, I was just in, I was really excited when I heard the Samfonsin. <laughs> I just have to learn Danish now. All the cool words come from Denmark, you know, all these great concepts. So um, I was supposed to actually go to Finland this year with Northampton Community College Social Work Department. They take their students to explore some of the uh, Scandinavian. And, you know, I know there's always a poll in our, in our profession about um, not wanting to just um, look at white models, right? So you go to Scandinavia, it's largely a very white population as opposed to things like going to Mexico or Africa and, and drawing on some of the struggles that folks down in some of the Southern hemisphere face, right? You know, there's not necessarily the economic privilege, but I, I'm always impressed by the, the, the clean lines, right? Of the um, Scandinavian approach to social services and. And although we have more challenges in terms of the number of people, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about possibly learning more from some of that culture as well. It's not my background, but um, to, to kind of take in all of it. And, and that might be really good. Like you said, I'll, I'm gonna have to think about some good research questions. Um, another thing that struck me, um, your presentation made me think back to some of the keynote presentations in the Global Conference on Sustainability in Higher Education. And a consistent theme for many of the speakers was contrasting what they see as our extractive capitalistic economic system and the potential, the possibility of a regenerative economic uh, system um, that might involve some elements of capitalism or not. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't, I don't recall you using the word capitalism, but to what extent do you think a capitalist economic system versus um, other models, whether they be hybrid or not, fits in with some of um, the, the argument you made today? Um, yeah, I agree. Um, so we have a conversation in a policy class with our students about could a social worker ever be a capitalist, a pure capitalist, right? 
um, because of the social work values sometimes lean more um, socialist-ish, right? Um, and so to me, I, when, I, when you're talking about that, and I, I'm gonna have to go back. Are those recorded, some of those higher ed conference sessions? Oh, good, I'm gonna go back and listen to some of them. Um, I, I think, you know, how do you, um, th this is where the, the social work value of the importance of human relationships comes into play. So if I wanna win over someone who has a different political philosophy, how do I do that, right? And so you can't always come in with the hammerhead, even though you might want to of your own opinion, um, but, you know, and, and I realize I respect all the ways that people do this, right? Some people have to do that and other people have to be the voice and pulling people along. Um, you know, you're not gonna get certain political leaders that we might currently have to buy into, let's just get rid of capitalism. That's just probably not ever gonna happen, right? Without a, a huge shift. So how do you somehow infuse and share and, and with a um, such a diverse, polarized political climate in the US right now, I think that's really hard. Um, and I'm hoping that at some point it'll come back around. I'm very um, um, hopeful by some of the conversations I heard from even my students. They're like, we have to change this. We have to do something different. And I keep pushing them to run for office. You know, I want them to be our leaders. Um, I encourage them to go on and get doctorates and, and um, you know, to run even at the smallest little office beyond your school board, you know what I mean? Um, because I tell them that you can make these choices. And we, you know, we were talking about the Philadelphia situation. I'm just gonna keep going back to that because it's so right here. Um, and about, well, what policy do you want changed? You know, well, I think we should have more training for police officers. Okay, so how would you get that started? You know, who do you need to contact? How do you do that? And so, you know, looking at the systems of our economy, that obviously is a broader audience. Um, but I think there, you know, we have to figure out how do we make that less threatening to some of the people who are obviously the 1%, the biggest stakeholders probably, right? Um, I don't know, can we? I, I don't know, that's a question. I'm not sure if it's just me being the dreamer, right? To imagine, but um, I can't let go of that or at least working towards it. Um, I just feel like there's too much at stake. Um, but I, I do agree when you talk about economic philosophies of capitalism or socialism, there's definitely gonna be people with strong voices in the room about that. It sounds like you've, you've come up with a good way to get um, students to think about that. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a shame that, that the words capitalism and socialism have become so politically fraught and divisive when really what we're talking about is how do we, how do we, um, Think about resources and how to use them in a in a, a just sustainable society, and that might involve elements of both capitalism and socialism. But the mm -hmm. conversations often get shut down right away um, because of the divisions you discussed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think sometimes maybe resisting being labeled with those terms, right? Pushing back on ways. And, and again, I'm not an economist, so I don't really know the answer, but finding ways to collaborate and, and push back and not be labeled by other people, but speaking our own identity. Um, you know, maybe there's something in between. I was trying to come up with a term that would capture both, like democratism, <laughs> social demo. I don't know. You think of something. You guys are all smarter than I am, I'm sure. But just ways to come up with, um, you know, how do you do this is the challenge, right? So. Yeah, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm really honored that you asked me to speak today and um, this was great. It's just, it's this is the kind of stuff I love and wish I could do more of, but you know, we all got to thank you. our bread. <laughs> thank you. We're, um, we're, we're grateful that you, um, uh, uh, accepted our invitation and made this presentation today. Um, thank you. And um, uh, for all of you who are still on the call within a couple of days, uh, recording and a copy of the slides will be um, posted to Digital Commons.